coming up on Theater Talk. You're the show boater, if you will, <laughs> in the courtroom, Patrick. Uh, fabulously, for lack of a better word, slimy performance as an old ambitious... I take that as an enormous compliment. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I can see Hot how I... Kettle. <laughs> <laughs> Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. Our job is to keep intact the system that served this country and this state so well, to make law and order the rule of the land, to reject the law of the jungle. What does he mean, jungle? Oh, From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Now, Susan, you know I love a courtroom drama. Kane Mutiny, A Few Good Men, and we have a real cracker of a courtroom drama on Broadway now at the Golden Theater. A Time to Kill, which is, has been adapted uh, from John Grisham's famous novel. Absolutely first-rate cast and a very good adapter, too, I might add, who have joined us tonight on Theater Talk. We are uh, with Sebastian Arcellus, who plays Jake, the uh, Matthew McConaughey part. As it movie. were. Yeah, you've got the same hair. <laughs> sure that's been pointed out. I heard that Deli one before. Oh, really? <laughs> is that deliberate on your part? Were you uh, channeling uh, his hair? or? Uh... No, this has been since birth. That's since you. birth. <laughs> uh, Fantastic actor, uh, John Douglas Thompson as Carl Lee, the man in the docket. Yes. Time to kill. Welcome to Theater Talk. Our great old friend Rupert Holmes, who has adapted John Grisham's book to the stage and wrote one of my favorite musicals of all time, The Mystery mm -hmm. of Edwin Drood. Welcome, Rupert. Thank you. And another old friend of ours, my old sparring partner from his Spider-Man days, Mr. Patrick Page, <laughs> who is playing a villain yet again this time, Patrick. Well, it depends on how you look at it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> villain is in the eye of the villain. All yeah, right, gentlemen, yeah, welcome all go. to Theater Talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, all right, Rupert, uh, did someone come to you to adapt the book, or is this a book that you read and you thought this could be a stage play? No, our, our producer, Daryl Roth, our lead producer, um, uh, along with Eva Price, uh, came to me and said, would you have a take on a John Grisham novel on stage? Because I've been having some discussions about that very topic. And I wondered how that could be done, or if that could be done. And I gravitated towards his very first novel, and I'm very glad I did. It's, it's, it's oh, so they gave you a choice. You could have done any one that you well, wanted to? No, I, I can't tell you that, but that was the one I went for immediately. Right. And what's struck me as I read it was that very much like for me the Kane Mutiny mm -hmm. and the Kane Mutiny Court Martial Love which them, yeah. is the courtroom drama that was plucked from a, a seat, section of the book yeah. Yeah. yeah I thought you know this could actually be an ultimate courtroom drama in that if I were to shift things just a little bit within the story you would have a man on trial for murder where the murder that he committed was in the same courtroom in which he's being tried. Right. Where the prosecutor, who was originally going to go after the victims of his crime, mm -hmm. right, uh, is now against him. Mm -hmm. Where the person who tried to console him before the crime is now representing him. I said, I, I don't think anyone's ever done that, not even Agatha Christie in a courtroom drama. And the other thing I like uh, uh, so much about courtroom dramas is you take all these sprawling, volatile emotions, and then force them into the absolute rigid, polite setting of a courtroom, which is probably our most civilized place on earth. Right. Um, it's the only place where if someone says, you'll stop talking now, you, you have to stop talking or you'll be taken and put in prison. And yet that's still happening within the framework of a democracy. Yeah. So I thought, you know, really there is potentially a tremendously theatrical piece here lying within these pages of this novel. And so I immediately said, I, I think this can be done. It will have a big cast, yeah, yeah. but I think hmm. it can be done. I, uh, very good point, and I want to get all, all of you, the, the actors in the play, your, your, your take on this, because I think um, when you do a courtroom drama, it just must be fun to be such a play that is, as, as Rupert says, inherently theatrical, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, when you go on every night and you're going to take... I'm not going to use the word journey because we hate that word. <laughs> you're going to take, take the audience into your world, and you know they're going to be the twists and the turns and the sort of rip-roaring, good old-fashioned, well-made, played kind of melodrama stuff. Do you, do you enjoy playing these kind of parts? Extremely so, and and especially with these these actors here before us. Uh, as Rupert was saying, there is something amazing about 
you are sort of inherently busting at the seams within the courtroom setting. Mm -hmm. And so it's how you weave around those, those conventions and those formalities, uh, how you break them down and how you uh, spar with one another that really make for an exciting night of theater. And, uh, and at the heart of it, you know, you have this amazing story that John Grisham, I mean, he's... Based on a real story, I believe, right? I mean, it wasn't something inspired by a, inspired real, by a real case that he witnessed event. himself, that he, he happened to be in court and, and saw a case that led him to do that wonderful thing that, that great storytellers do, which is to think, what if? Yeah. What, what if I took it a notch further? Mm -hmm. what, would, what would be the outcome of that? And that was really what inspired him to write this very first novel, something. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, he was sitting in the courtroom listening to an arraignment of, you know, someone who had committed this similar crime, and he thought to himself, if I only had a gun. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Something to that mm -hmm. effect. And in your character, you know, you, 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 we're not giving away the secrets here, but you no. kill these guys who rape your daughter. It's interesting because the courtroom setting also is a show business setting. Yes. You guys, mm -hmm. are, uh, you guys are performing. You're the only one who's not performing, though. I mean, your character, is he well, he's not performing? Well, here. no, I mean, and that's what, as you were talking about seeing the courtroom being inherently dramatical or a dramatic environment, for me, it's not. Obviously, for Carl Lee, because of what's going on for, for his character. But for me, it's it's kind of the exploration of a man who gets pulled into the court system, mm -hmm. right? Loses the control because one of the things we talked about in rehearsal is, you know, when you're up in a situation like that, you lose control. The yep. lawyer mm -hmm. kind of re represents you and who you mm -hmm. are. So for me, it was more of a journey of a man who was living a fairly decent life, good family, happy wife, happy kids, and then this. A uh, horrible uh, thing happens with his daughter, and it kind of rips him into a place of vengeance, and then he's pulled into the court system, and now he's fighting for his life through that. Now, uh, <coughs> speaking of showbiz, you, you're the showboater, if you will, in the courtroom, Patrick. Uh, fabulously, for lack of a better word, slimy performance as an old ambitious... I take that as an enormous compliment. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I can see how much... I, yeah. <laughs> but I can see you're just having hmm. fun. I mean, this guy, does this guy, this prosecutor you play, does he believe in anything but the greater glory of himself? I think the thing about uh, a man like Rufus Buckley is that uh, he convinces himself thoroughly that he believes it. Mm -hmm. It also happens to be a way to achieve his political ends. Yep, yep. But um, it's not a difficult thing for me playing the role to convince myself that a man who's gunned down two people who are handcuffed yeah. and go on their way back to jail is the right thing to do to prosecute that man. That it, the system breaks down altogether if we let men like Carl Lee walk free. And it's, of course, complicated by the fact that it happens in a small Mississippi town in the mid 80s, mm -hmm. race is a huge issue. The people prosecuting him are white and he's a black man in a primarily white community and that's where it gets complicated. And the other great thing about a courtroom, of course, is that um, as an actor, I guess one of the things we're always trying to do is, is pretend less. <laughs> we want things to be more real. Yeah, right. We want to get less and less pretending. And in a situation like this, because of the way it's been directed, where the, the, the audience becomes the jury, there's no jury on stage, yeah, yeah. but the stage rotates, and now the audience is the you jury. You guys address the audience throughout the play, because yes. we are the jury. Yeah. I thought yeah. it was yeah. very yeah. cleverly staged. And therefore, uh, there's very little pretending one has to do. Mm. Um, you can actually try to convince the audience. You can actually go head-to-head -head with um, Sebastian. You can actually try to put Carl Lee away. Every night before the show, I tell John, I say, you're going down tonight. He walks by my dressing room, I say, dead man walking. It struck me, though, Rupert, although this is about a man who was avenging a terrible crime when he murdered, that it was a very subversive story, because if you're to take your character's part, you are saying that vengeance is justifiable. Yes, you could argue that this is our, making a case for vigilanteism. Or is well, there ever a time to kill and what the legal yeah. implications of, of yeah. doing that? You were going to say, Rupert? No, I was just going to say, any time that Patrick is making the case against Carly, I'm sitting there and thinking, Exactly. I can't really Wait, that, well, yeah. that is exactly. not that easy. But, but and it's right. what yeah. makes right. Jake, what makes Sebastian's challenge really theoretically insurmountable, which is that what what is this defense <coughs> that oh, you can possibly have? I saw the show last night, and I was thinking, we're not going to give the twist and turns and how you know, mm -hmm. get the better of each other here and there. But after everything has been gone your way, let's say, mm -hmm. when you give the final summation, if I'm in the jury, I would have voted to convict you. 
you killed two people who never had a trial, who, who, weren't, acu- who weren't convicted of anything. Right. I, that's how it seems. It seems like it's a, it's a win-win or in a situation that it's in, in the bucket, right? Yep. But I think there's a human element to it. Yep. There's a human question, mm-hmm. and that's what, that's what you puts, pr- puts before the jury. If this was your daughter, your goddaughter, or a mm-hmm. loved one, what would you do? Obviously, the jury's all white. Right. So once we switch it, and he makes the case that it's not just about race, mm-hmm. what if this was your daughter, then that's the human element that shows well, up. And yeah, emotion emotion outweighs facts at that point. Yeah. Uh, we got to wrap it up soon, but Patrick, I can't let you escape without uh, getting your take on, um, on Spider-Man, which you were at the center of it all. Still going on despite my best efforts to bring it down. We have defeated <laughs> you, Michael. We have defeated years. you. <laughs> Must make you feel so good to completely uh, uh, neuter the most powerful columnist on Broadway. <laughs> yes, and who is that? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Walked in. Goblin Hall. He walked right in <laughs> that one. Uh, uh, Glenn Berger's got a book uh, he wrote. I know. Berger. Apparently, you, you've read it. I have not I, read it. You have it. not read it. Will, I, you, will you read it? I will certainly read it. If you, if you were to hand it to me now, I would end this interview and start reading it. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's no, I'm, di- I'm dying to read it. Well, the thing I'm curious about, though, and, and uh, I've written about this in the column, and Glenn is coming on the show in a couple of weeks, so we'll certainly be talking about this. Uh, you know, he and Julie were collaborators, and she really plucked him from obscurity and poverty, as he admits in the book. And, uh, you know, he betrayed her. He turned, he turned against her. How did you feel as being in the show at that time when that was going on? How did you feel about uh, his act of, um, of a Judas? Well, you know, we were really, as a, as a cast, and this is to the credit of, of all of the people involved, Julie, Glenn, Phil McKinley, who took over, uh, and the producers, uh, we were really insulated from that. And, um, and Julie uh, bore everything with a tremendous dignity because uh, I am a friend of Julie's and yeah. she could have said everything to me and 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 um, and really protected us protected us as a cast from what was going on behind the scenes mm-hmm. so um, at the time there was there was not really an issue of taking sides because we didn't know really what the heck was going on mm-hmm. um, we knew the show was taking you were just worried turn. for your lives every time you went out on the stage I was never worried <laughs> I've ne- Michael I've never felt safer in a theater and that's the truth <laughs> Uh, but in the end, though, I mean, do you think Julie was treated unfairly? I'm putting you on the spot here, like the courtroom. Yeah, you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> um, I, I, I won't say whether Julie was treated unfairly or not. I will say that I think all of the people involved um, really, really tried to do their jobs. Mm-hmm. Julie was doing the job of an artist and stuck by it in a way that few artists are able to do. Almost all of us who call ourselves artists when someone really comes up and says, well, it's this or you go, we'll say, well, we'll do it your way then. Julie won't do that. And for that, I admire her tremendously. On the other hand, the producers had a $75 million show and they had something that they felt was necessary. Whether or not I agree with that or Julie agrees with that or anybody agrees with that is immaterial to the fact that they were doing their jobs as producers. So it was, I just, in the same way that if, if one comes from a divorced family, <laughs> one says, do you love your mom? Do you love your dad? Yeah, I love them both. And, uh, and so it's not for me to say, but uh, I, I'm happy that they worked it all out, that they settled all of that, that they didn't have. I'm not. I wanted to go to court. I it would know, have been a fabulous to to show in town. I you could have adapted it for the stage. I didn't want to go to court. Uh, you know, I knew I was on some of the You would have been list. testifying. Yeah. Yeah. And then I wouldn't have been able to run around it the way I have here. <laughs> <laughs> Very well said, Patrick. There's a reason why you're playing that uh, tricky uh, prosecutor in A Time to Kill. All right, the uh, play is A Time to Kill at the Golden Theater, adapted uh, by our good friend Rupert Holmes from John Grisham's book. And we should say Mr. Grisham has a new book out called Sycamore Row that none of you have read yet, but yeah, I understand you all have autographed copies. We Please. do. All right, um, Sebastian Arcelos, who plays Jake. The cute, nice lawyer that all the girls like. <laughs> got a little edge to him, too. Edge to him too. <laughs> uh, John Douglas Thompson, a terrific performance as, um, uh, as a man with great dignity, Carl Lee in the play. Uh, Rupert, it's always a pleasure to always. see you. And uh, Patrick Page, I'll have you back in. Really press you. <laughs> You're going down, my uh, friend. Badgering the witness. Badgering the witness. Badgering. Badgering. Overruled. Overruled. You're talking to you. Thank you very much and good night. <laughs> I'm that terrible and bloody day, Mr. Hayden. Didn't you play God? Maybe I did. I think the jury would like to hear that answer. Maybe I did. And it felt good, didn't it? You know it did. And you do it again, no regrets. Oh, you're damn right. Oh, wait, I just wish I could have killed him more.
And we have now one of our favorite guests of all time. The man owns London. He owns England. He has the most influential column in the Daily Mail in London, our good friend Baz Bamming Boy. Welcome back to Nice to see you. How many readers do you have at the Daily Mail? Something like four or five million? Oh, many, 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 many. Yeah, about that. <laughs> they don't all read me, sadly, but we have a lot of readers. Everybody reads Baz Bamming Boy on and, Friday. And of course, we're big online as well. Well, welcome to New York. You're doing a tour of all the shows opening yes. this fall. And of course, the biggest one, uh, with its 14 or $15 million advance, is Harold Pinter's Betrayal with uh, uh, Daniel Craig and Rachel Weiss, directed by Mike Nichols. And you didn't mention Rafe Spall. He's, Rafe's the, he's the big surprise. He's quite yeah, wonderful. Yeah. All right, so yeah. you've seen it. Give us your assessment of it. Well, I'm a, a, I like the play, mm -hmm. but, like, but it's not always done well, especially in this country. Mm. I mean, I did see a production a few years ago with Juliette Binoche. Which yeah, and Liev Schreiber. Schreiber. I try hard to forget. She, he was good in it, Liev Schreiber. He was good, yeah. Anyway, this is great. Across, you know, it's lavish, yep. but I tell you, it's impeccably done. Mm -hmm. In my view, I mean, there are a few Americans sitting there a bit po-faced, po <laughs> but I kind of I like it. It's kind of it's it's kind of dangerous, a little bit wicked and passionate. It's the most passionate betrayal I've seen in years. Did you see the original betrayal, the original production? I'm not that old, <laughs> <laughs> but I did. But as it happens, <laughs> I did. <laughs> Who was in the original? Oh my God, Michael Gambon. Oh, fabulous actor. Uh, Daniel Massey. and Penelope Wilton. Uh, now you, I believe, you knew Harold Pinter. Yeah, he used to come out for tea every day. Uh, no, no, no. But I kind of would see him on the rounds, and I kind of, you know, for several years he hated my guts. Why? Because he was a prickly character. Oh, he was prickly. Well, because I kind of, I, I kind of got involved in covering his dalliances. You know, when he was having an affair with um, uh, Antonia Fraser, his his, his, wife, his widow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I covered that and the breakup of her marriage to her husband. And so he thought I was kind of lower than a snake's navel, frankly. <laughs> and he may, have, he may well have been right. Um, so, you know, I mean, you call him up or go around to his house and it would be, I'm putting the phone down now. <laughs> Click. <laughs> Alan Bennett does that as well. Oh, really? I'm putting the phone down now, Mr. Bammy Boy, ever so politely. <laughs> oh. And so, down it goes. So when you call some of these people in London, is there, do you know that, you, that you've chilled their blood a little bit? Because you're only calling to find out something they don't want you to know. Well, precisely. And of course, one always knows the answer, the same as you do. You know, and you know if someone's going to lie to you. Um, so yeah, you, you, you call them up, and uh, sometimes you know they hate your guts, and sometimes they love you. I prefer it when they kind of hate you in a while. Did you, uh, right, did you ever have any you real run-ins with Harold Pinter? Because it's, it's much more fun. Yeah, to kind of get stories out of people who don't like you. Yeah, that's well, that's when you have to learn how to be a reporter. To get people to tell you, you, you things. You've got to kind of use up a bit of shoe leather and get in there. And, Precisely. And do a bit of work. Did you and Pinter ever sort of come to any kind of a accommodation or understanding? I mean, did he respect what yes, you did? Yes, we did, because he noticed that I liked the theater. He used to see me at first nights, and he started saying, what are you doing here? Um, <laughs> this is the theater. This is the, this is the cathedral of culture. Oh, God. <laughs> that sort of thing. But, the, the, but it was fine afterwards, because he, he could see me at shows and stuff, and I, you know, so I cover the whole thing, not just big musicals and... Uh, yeah, you cover everything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we got on well. And I even cover some of his movies. Hmm. So. Uh, what did you think of uh, Daniel Craig, you know, one of the world's biggest stars over here? Uh, is he, he quits, quits himself well in this production? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But all these, all three of the cast members come from the theatre, don't forget. Right. So, you know, people know him as James Bond, but he knows how to, he, you know, he cut his acting chops at the Royal Court. Are you talking to Daniel Craig here? Are you interviewing him for the paperback? Uh, uh, no, but um, Rafe Spall and, I know, Spall and I know each other pretty well. Right, right, right. I did find that Daniel Craig's physicality, which is, I mean, he's just very pumped up and yeah. uh, his face is certainly quite perfect. And his physicality did not go into me, me in the same world as Rafe Spall, who's like a kind of ordinary guy actor. The, the character that, um, that Daniel plays, um, Robert, is the more masculine character, yes. I've, I've always yes. thought. And um, so, and, you know, he's, he's, you know he, he admits to hitting his wife. Yeah. And so he's quite tough, quite beefy. So I thought he was perfectly cast, personally. And so Jerry, played by Rafe, is the kind of the more, well, what can one say about? Cerebral. Thank you. Um, <laughs> very good. Um, so I thought they were perfectly matched, personally. And I, th and I thought it's the first time I'd realized, and you know, there's a great scene halfway through the play where um, uh, Robert's getting totally sloshed. Yes. He's about to meet Jerry for lunch. Yes. And it's an upturned bottle. I've never seen that before. 
So you know immediately that it's in, in his cups. And this play is based on one of these flings that you probably uh, covered. It's based on Harold Pinter's affair with a BBC... With Joan Bakewell. A presenter, right? I was a baby at the time, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> when they broke up both their marriages, didn't Yes, they? absolutely. But they used to, they used, literally used to meet at this place in Kilburn and... Uh, I don't know if it went on for seven years as long as it does in the play. But the, the, the setting of the play is where they actually met in real life. In, in, in Kilburn, affair. yeah, absolutely. Fascinating. But and what's fascinating is how do people carry on these affairs and no one knows? Well, you found out. <laughs> <laughs> you put it in your papers, Bass. The, the later ones, yes. <laughs> right. um, what do you make of... I mean, we, you know, we, we have to be honest, we get press seats, we don't have to pay for tickets. But, you know... I pay for tickets when I come here. I don't blag everything from press people, you know. I use press tickets to go to Betrayal, but often, you know, I went out to um, um, the paper mill in New Jersey to see, um, what the hell is the show called? Oh, Honeymoon in Vegas. Yeah. And I paid for that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I kind of, it's easier. But what do you make, though, of a the ticket, the top ticket price on Broadway for Betrayal is $500. Yeah, but the thing is, I mean, listen, I, premium, premium prices are the work of the devil as far as I'm concerned. However, I do understand that, you know, ticket touts, they buy these tickets for nothing. I mean, there were tickets going on the weekend for $2,000 to see Betrayal. Yeah. But the producers don't get that money. So I can understand why people like Scott Rudin think, okay, if they're getting two grand, I'm getting 500. What the market will bear. Absolutely. So I don't like it, but I kind of understand the economics of it. Right. I resent it. Um, so give us a little uh, preview here. Uh, Susan and I are both big, fran big fans of Stephen Fry, who's in town with Twelfth Night. Oh. You've seen this in London, right? Is yes. He, is yes. he as delightful as we oh, hope he is totally. in Alvolio? Totally. And what's so glorious about seeing it in New York, I was wor worried that the, um, forgive me, that you Americans wouldn't be educated enough to get Shakespeare. <laughs> Thank you. But there were <laughs> no, it's Peter we don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> but the great thing was watching it was that the audience were, were getting all the gags, all the sort of intimate, intricate jack gags. And sort of, as uh, someone said afterwards, you know, that, that they really kind of went with the flow. I was sitting right at the back, so I could You could feel the, the waves of laughter. I could feel it. And there was one woman who was almost answering back. Oh. And that's always a good sign. You know, that is a great sign, because I've got to tell you, over the years, we've seen a lot of Shakespeare, and there's nothing more boring. Than boring Shakespeare. Than boring Shakespeare. Boring bard. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. You want to you wanna leave immediately. But listen, this is really good. And the Richard III is good as well. I mean, it's not just because the guys dress up as girls, of course, as they did in the Elizabethan. Yeah, this is the, on all, all male productions of Richard yeah, III. Yeah, well. yeah, 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 yeah. And do um, you know Samuel Barnett, who was in the History Boys? Oh, yeah, he's wonderful. He's actor, in this. Yeah. And he, he, he looks... He's Olivia, right? Yeah, he looks... He, he, he looks, looks like he, a girl. Well, he looks cool. He looks, <laughs> <laughs> he looks cool. I mean, not my type, but no. But no, he, looks, he dresses yeah. up well. And there's a very good young actor called uh, Joseph Timms, and he dresses up in Richard III. I mean, it's, it's just glorious. Yeah, well, we're looking forward to that. Uh, before we go, I, I want to get a little sense of what's going on in London. Um, Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd Webber, uh, friends of ours who've been on the show a number yes. of times, they both have musicals going up head to head. Tim's yes. got From Here to Eternity. Yeah, I came to New York while that opened. Uh, deliberately, so you didn't I, have to No, worry. I did see a preview of that. And can you tell us, is it any good? Well, my mother told me never to use the word interesting, but it is interesting. <laughs> really? It's not <laughs> good, but interesting. There's three or four good songs in it, but I mean, uh, it's, it's not for me. Yeah, because we, Susan and I really... To, we, to we, use your phrase. That's, that's why I said betrayal was not for me. But right. Susan and I loved him, so we are kind of rooting for him. No, I loved him. him, and there's some really nice songs in it, but it's, it's just kind of... We're not going to see it over here, in other words. I don't know that it's going to be coming here. Look, they've got to, they've got to tighten it, and they've got to kind of restage it, redirect it. I mean, there's a good show there, but ain't there yet, right. in and, my humble view. And what do you hear about Andrew's new uh, show, Stephen Ward, which is uh, part of the Profumo affair, the famous... Uh, yeah, I mean, I love scandal. the whole idea of it. Yeah. I love the scandal. I mean, you know... Christine so like, Keeler. And, yeah, I love all that stuff, yeah. all that cool girl stuff. <laughs> Did you but, cover all that stuff? Not, no, he's not that old. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, when the movie came out with Ian McKellen a yes, few years good ago, movie, yeah, scandal, I yeah. did take Christine Keeler for tea. <gasps> oh, fantastic. And she was fantastic. She, I mean, it's a shame because my paper and other papers keep showing these horrible pictures of how she looks now. But she, was, she turned up and she, was, she looked impeccable and she was very eloquent about what went on. Huh. Um, and she was really great fun. So I love the whole idea of it. I haven't heard very many of the songs, unlike you. Um, <laughs> I've heard four or five, and I've got to say they're, they're good. Are you in his pocket? No, uh, no, 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 not at all. Uh, in fact, Andrew and I have had a, a prickly relationship. We're friendly now, but 
over the years, when he was doing Sunset Boulevard, for example, yeah. I had been leaked uh, actually financial statements from the show, right. which said the show is a total loser. And they were pretending it was the biggest hit of all time. Uh -huh. But you may remember, it yeah. collapsed all, everywhere it played, it collapsed, and it almost brought down his empire. Yeah. Remember, he, was, he closed the New York office, the Australia. That's right. And I wrote a big uh, piece on that called Pained Weber, the end of Andrew Lloyd Webber's empire. So he didn't speak to me for a while. But. Well, talking of talking of names, you, what was this? There was a name that people, uh, the guys for w Wicked Whispers came up with, uh, Love Never Dies. <laughs> what was it? Paint Never Dries? Paint Never Dries, right. <laughs> which killed Love Never Dies. I know, but they, they've come up with another one for Stephen Wall, which is a bit unfair because they haven't seen it. Oh, the West it? End like, Winters, oh, yes, yes. What is it? I don't want to get sued for this. Andrew, if you're watching this, I'm just passing on inf information Absolutely. to my colleagues here. <laughs> Stephen Ward, leaving board. Ooh. That's all I'm saying. They, 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 they the claim West that. Western Wingers, who've been on the show, actually. They claim that. Stephen Borton and Levy. They, they claim that. But I mean, I think that they're just getting prepared. Right. As right. it were. Well, Baz Bammy Boy, it's always a pleasure. I never miss your column in the Daily Mail, which you can get online. You've got one of the best websites, by the way, of all the newspapers. Thank you. I mean, there's any gossip in the world going on, somehow it, the Daily Mail gets hold of it. I know, I know. It's all there. It's, it's a place to go. All right, well, have a good time while you're here in New York, Baz, and thanks for being a guest. Good to always see you. on Theater Talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure to see you. <laughs> Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency.